This is Kyle. Kyle, hi. Hi, Austin. Nice to see you. I just got off the phone with uh, with Chairman Steele, and he was uh, he was trying to log in. I guess he had a few problems, but he's oh, he's on his way yeah, okay. to uh, to the virtual world with us. Great. Oh, thank you for checking in. Um, Absolutely. Making sure that we all connect. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you for you? for inviting me on here. This is this is exciting, and anytime I can talk about water, I'm I'm happy to do so. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great that this is happening. Um, it certainly is. Feels like it's been a long time in coming, but um, it's uh, it's great to make it happen. Um, so I agree. I'm glad that you all could join us. Thank you. Well, are are you in uh, are you in Los Angeles today? No, I'm up in Washington. I've uh, been up oh, here for a little while. Wonderful. Um, are yeah. are you all free of smoke? It's cleared up. Yeah, it's been raining enough now that it's kind of um, drifted away. But um, it, it has had been a pretty smoky overcast for a while. And you too must have been, you're, you're really right there. Oh, we've been, we've been breathing the ashes of California for seemingly two months right now. It's been just very, very problematic. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, never. I I live in Reno, and um, and you know I've seen some bad years, but never has it been this sustained for for this long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a uh, it starts okay, to become nice. like a scary time of year with all of this. That's right. Um. Good news, Kyle. It's clear over and, here. And no one. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I I heard that uh, you all, Delane and Rick, you all had a, a close call with the fires over there too. Glad that hasn't. You been sure did. Yeah. It got to the point where we actually foamed our house. We thought the fire was coming to us, but it rained on it. Just a tad. Just, just uh, enough to put it out. Didn't put it out, just <laughs> enough to... Just so it, it held it down until fire crews got here. Then they were here for three days, so you can pretty much imagine. Wow. We had, had helicopters and water and... Oh, sorry, Delane. I was go just, ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start the <laughs> webinar. And so people will let people start kind of trickling in. But keep, you guys can keep chatting. Right. Okay. okay, we're now live. Great. Okay. So we all shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was out there um, near you uh, around Ely. Uh, I don't know if it was last year this time um, or a couple of years ago, and all the hotels were booked up. I couldn't figure out what it was, um, and every hotel in town was full, and I asked, and I said, well, it's fire season. It's all the fire crews are out here, mm -hmm. and they're out, you know, cutting brush or whatever to do fire suppression. Um but yeah, it's something that is feels really present right now. Well, we've made the mistake of letting of uh, killing all the natural uh, plant life and all the cheat grasses moved into up into the mountains everywhere. So the cheat cheat grass is terribly flammable and 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 nothing eats it. Or really early in the spring, right. so it just gets worse all the time. And the cows, 
The sheep won't eat it. They eat everything. <laughs> is there a way to manage it? I mean, is there a way to do kind of traditional fire management? We didn't have cheat. We didn't have tra uh, cheat grass. No, it's sort of uh, something that came in with the with the cattle ranching. Right. Invasive species. Uh huh. Invasive species, and it's not edible, so then it's always there. And it's all over. Water. It's all over the. It's all over the West now, so it's 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 pretty ugly. Yeah. It's evolved to want fire. Hmm. Because it's dead by the autumn, dead by late summer. So if it burns. It just Yeah. Use much water. Yeah, that's true. Well, Oscar, someone um, implored me the other day that the next time you're out in the Baker, Ely area, Spring Valley area, there is a uh, there's a woman named Nomi Shepherd who lives in mm. Baker, I, and she is uh, she's a dome builder herself, and uh, uh, the president of, uh, of my board of directors, uh, wanted me to just let you know that because she is, she's an avid dome enthusiast and, you know, I think a big believer in, in, in the architecture. And so oh, when you're okay. out, if you go out that way and, you know, looking to find a connection, um, there, there are people in the Baker. Interesting. Oh, that's great. Wow. Well, huh. she's a good gardener and a really good cook. You like it. <laughs> Delane knows where all the good cooking is out in uh, mm -hmm. and valleys out there. She knows who to stay away from and where to go. <laughs> Passed yeah. down through the ages. <laughs> The essential knowledge, yeah. <laughs> she's. Did you say she's on the board, the Great Basin Water Network? No, the um, she's just friends with uh, with the president of uh, of our board of directors. But we'll be happy. We'd be happy to get you in touch with her for whenever you go out there. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've also wanted to. Um, be in touch with um, Monty. Sorry, Monty Sanford. My name, Monty Sanford. Yeah, um, someone I haven't spoken with yet. Well, he's um, you know I I speak with him uh, often, and uh, you know if if you need anything or let me know. But if you reach out to him, he's really good at responding. He lives. Um, mm -hmm. He lives in like North Fork, Idaho, out in the middle of nowhere. Like the closest town to him is Missoula, and it's a two-hour drive. Um, oh, okay, yeah. And, and so sometimes his internet gets a little spotty. I know about that. Yeah, yeah. we're all kind of in <laughs> outlying areas of internet uh, feasibility. One of the many benefits of, of living in a rural area. <laughs> well, if you're going out to Baker, you might want to check with Lori too. She has a dome. What was that, Rick? You you broke up a little bit. Uh, Lori out in Baker. She's got a dome too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. So I'll have good good neighbors out there. At the Dome Club. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's built like a team. <laughs> Can you hear me at all? Can you hear me? Is it on mute? Yeah. I can I, I, I can hear you. One second, I'll be right back. Now's our chance to talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys um, in uh, in the next couple of days. I got uh, I got a lot of tomatoes for you, Delane, and some some lettuce, and maybe even a cucumber and some peppers. Hmm. Do you like black bean stuff squash? Oh, that sounds delicious. <laughs> Are you, you bringing know, your bike? Uh, I, I, I've been, um, contemplating right, that. <laughs> you can always ride one of mine. That's right. Hey, you can try that new scooter out. That's what I was just going to ask you. I just finished. Wow. And it actually works. Well, that's no surprise. <laughs> what what does the time does this have the time on there anywhere? I don't know, but uh oh, here. Ten ten? Ten ten eleven. Oscar, I'll let you kind of lead and I'm gonna go ahead and hop off. Oh, Chairman Steele's on the call. Oh, okay. Uh, we can't hear him. Let's see. Wait, just step in here. Mm -hmm. Just keep it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Get started in a few minutes.
Chairman Steele, if you want to try speaking, I think we've added you. But you're muted. Okay, I can add Hello. Oh, hey. Rupert. Hello. Hi, Rupert. Hello. Hi, hey, Rupert. Hello, Charlie Steele. <laughs> Can you hear me? Wonderful that everyone is able to join us. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I wonder if I should get started, I guess. Yeah, I'll quickly just want to, on behalf of LAND, thank everyone for joining us this Good. morning. Thank you, Oscar, um, for assembling this conversation, sharing it with us, and I will pass it over to you to get started and introduce the speakers, however you want to um, conduct the conversation. And as I put in the chat, if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A and we'll make sure that everything gets done. Great. Um, thank you, Laura. And um, and thank everyone for uh, for being here and joining us. Uh, this is um, really a, for me a great honor to to welcome uh, our guests today, and to um, really tell the story of Spring Valley uh, and the Shoshone theaters. Um, uh, it's a really special, um, sacred place for, uh, for, for, for all of us who are familiar with it, really. And um, uh, so, yeah, without any further ado, I, I'd like to actually just kind of um, give a short history of my uh, involvement in the project which is, is really recent. Um, I began uh, working on a kind of um, zone architecture several years ago, a long time ago. Um, and it's a, an architecture that is, was developed by Stephen Holly Bayer in 19, around 1970. Um, it's a passive solar kind of building it's heated and cooled using just water and sunlight. Um, and so I'd, I'd been working with this building, uh, this house for several years. Um, it's originally based in Corrales, New Mexico, near Albuquerque. And 
um, as I was working on it, um, I built my own version of this building. Didn't really have a site for it. I was looking for a location. <clears throat> and around this time, I was spending time in the, in the Great Basin, which is um, in the high desert between Nevada and Utah. Um, it's a really unique kind of island ecosystem that rises out of the Great ba the Great Salt Lake. And although the Great Basin is dry and very arid with not very much rainfall, it sits on top of, I guess, a, the remnants of an ancient ocean. Um, so it's an ecosystem that's surprisingly green and verdant. There are wild horses, antelope, elk, um, as well as turtles and birds of all kinds. Um, it's really quite amazing. And um, in addition to that, it's the home of the bristlecone pine, uh, the oldest organisms on the planet, and a unique group, a unique forest of trees known as the Shoshone cedars or the swamp cedars or Basawabi in the Shoshone language. Um, and these trees depend on a, an ancient, uh, this ancient water underground, um, the vast subterranean aquifers uh, underneath the Great Basin. Um, there's plenty of water there to sustain the life in this place, but most of it's invisible. Um, and the, the, the place where we really can experience that water is through the trees in Basawabi, which is a, a unique uh, uh, valley um, populated by junipers, the Juniperus scul sculpularum as the swamp cedar is known. <clears throat> um, so, uh, that's how I, I came to this place a couple of years ago, just discovering the, 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 the natural beauty of the Great Basin and also understanding that like Corrales, New Mexico, it is at that same altitude, same temperature condition um, as this other kind of high desert architecture. And so as I, I started to think about um, what this particular architecture uh, that functions through sunlight and water um, could do, the Great Basin started to um, uh, seem the natural place for a structure of this kind. Um, a, a way to make the natural cycles of water and light visible in a building. Um, there's so much more about this story that I hope that we'll we'll get into now. Um, that's just my introduction. Um, and and as I started to understand more about the significance of the water in Basawabi in this place. Um, it is a story that is thousands of years old, really. And um, so in order to understand it, we, we need to um, have an understanding of how this place was traditionally used by the Shoshone and Goshu people who have lived there um, since the time. And um, the threats to that groundwater that are currently posed by the um, development of Las Vegas. Um, so uh, 
I'd like to in, uh, introduce my guests now. Um, I'm really thrilled to have you all here with me. Kyle Roerink um, is the executive director of the Great Basin Water Network. Um, Kyle's been an outspoken advocate of the water of the Great Basin um, for years. And the Great Basin Water Network for over 30 years has, has fought to prevent the water pipeline from Las Vegas to spring. It's a $15 billion water pipeline project that would um, run 350 miles from Las Vegas north to Spring Valley and um, uh, mine the groundwater of the Spring Valley. Um, and Kyle and the Great Basin Water Network has, has been fighting this project every step of the way and has built a broad coalition um, to protect groundwater for future generations. Um, Delane Billsbury um, <clears throat> is an Ely Shoshone elder and one of the most articulate uh, defenders of Basawabi and the water that sustains it. Delane is also an artist um, whose work um, comes from the sacred place um, uh, where she lives uh, in McGill, Nevada. And Rupert Steele um, is chairman of the Confederate Tribes of Truth Nation. Chairman Steele is a lifelong resident of the area and has been um, an articulate voice in um, explaining the significance of this place and the importance of uh, the trees the, and the water that sustains them. Um, and more than that, really, um, at the beginning of this project, like I was saying, um, I had a building in search of a site and I came to Rupert, uh, to Chairman Steele and asked permission um, to pursue this project there in uh, Spring Valley at a site called Cedar Spring. And um, from the very beginning, Chairman Steele was, was very welcoming. And um, in a lot of the ways, I feel like uh, water school is as much your idea as it is mine. Uh, Chairman Steele, I, I thank you um, profoundly for your leadership and your vision in this issue. And um, <clears throat> so uh, maybe um, we can start by um, talking about the swamp cedars themselves, the Shoshone cedars. Um, Chairman Steele, could you um, talk to us about what that place means for uh, for you and for the Gautu people. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me start off with a little bit of history. Uh, when you hear the word ba or ba, that means that uh, you see it across the signs, like Ilipa, Ilipa, Duvava, stuff like that. They usually, the ba means a standing water. So that's how you tell that there's water in those places. And uh, I think everybody knows about American Indian history. Uh, the way it's being taught now is that we came from uh, 
uh, Russia, from Siberia, we have a land bridge. But uh, the question rises, who made the decision when they got here, who's going to be a Sashoni, who's going to be a Paiu, who's going to be a Navajo, who's going to be a whatever tribe. But there's uh, 577 different tribes. And when you uh, start looking for those. Excuse me, Rupert. Yeah. Rupert, could you excuse me for a second? Hey, Oscar, could you mute your, uh, could you mute your system? Because uh, we're getting a lot of noise. Good. Go ahead, Rupert. Sorry. Okay. Uh, somebody had to make the decision on who's going to be what tribe and where you're going to go if we all came from one place. So that kind of dispels the, uh, the myth of the land bridge. So, um, you know, we, we were all taught in uh, our history classes that we, that's where we came from. And the other thing that uh, uh, dispels that myth is, uh, you know, every time we find a uh, ancient remains, we turn that over to the universities for study. You know, they've been going on for a lot of years ever since Columbus got here. So what are they looking for? So in hindsight, they're looking for something that ties us back to Siberia to prove what the government did, the American Indians, was correct. And uh, so when we came down here, each tribe, has their own creation story. So, uh, like the ghost shoots, our creation story is that uh, take a picture of Santa Claus over started from California, put all these Indians in one bag, came across the country and start dropping off people. You be a uh, Shoshone, you stay here. You be Paiute, you stay here. You be Goshute. You had a problem with Goshute. You know, it was uh, such a place where he thought that uh, would require a person who could survive out here. So he looked uh, into his bag. There was a little short, stout, stocky, Indian in there, and he pulled him out and said, hey, you stay here, you'll be a ghost you. So that's our creation story. But each tribe has their own creation story. It's interesting to hear how they uh, they say where, uh, where they came from. <clears throat> so uh, our Aboriginal lands uh, used to go from uh, Salt Lake City, uh, 30 miles west of uh, uh, Wendover, then up to uh, Ely, over to Delta, back to the Wasatch Front. And uh, it was over 12 million acres that we had. So uh, we knew by treaty we did not cede any lands. So I kept pursuing that. They finally uh, came out and said that we lost the land by encroachment. So uh, one of our treaties has been uh, over, a lot of these Indian treaties has been broken over and over again. So the one we signed in Tuala Valley was of peace and friendship. So that uh, made it uh, to where the president feels that he can create a reservation and move the Indians on there. So that's the, uh, that's when he said uh, that uh, there was a reason of three tribes of the Confederate tribes, the uh, Iwipa Confederate tribes of Goshut, the Gandhi band of Goshuts, 
and the Skull Valley Band of Goshutes. So they came out and called them confederated. But now Skull Valley is their own separate sovereign nation. Well, Gandhi and uh, uh, Ivapa remained as one confederate. So uh, when this uh, issue of uh, Southern Nevada law and water development came about over 30 years ago, I was a young man when my uh, father was on the tribal council fighting that. And he said that the BIA will take care of us, which they did for a long time. They protested all the water applications. But during uh, one of the hearings, they came out and signed the uh, mitigation management and uh, monitoring plan that was set forth and signed it at uh, 11 o'clock, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, and said that the tribes agree with that plan, which we were not consulted with. So uh, we've been fighting that uh, 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 groundwater development for a long time. And uh, the uh, big issue that keep Rising its ugly head was, how come you guys say there's a lot of water out here? But when you guys run your calculations, why don't you include the source of water? Meaning we only get snow and rainfall out here, but they refuse to, uh, to use that as part of their calculation. So, uh, and the other thing was that they keep saying, uh, we won't know how much water is down there until we start pumping. And then we ask the question, who's gonna turn out the pump when we know that the water is being lowered? Still no answer for, to that. So uh, it's been a lengthy fight, but uh, I think it was worth it to uh, protect the uh, swamp cedars. Swamp cedars, or oh, Spring Valley, uh, has a, a number of uh, sites out there, rock writings. That whole place was used extensively by the Shoshone people and other tribes that came through there. <clears throat> so when I say that um, it's a sacred and hallowed ground, uh, people ask me, what do you mean by that? I say, well, before anybody got here, my ancestors, they traveled this country foot by foot. So there's a lot of footprints here. And some of them have uh, passed away. And the remains are still here. So that's why I say it's sacred and hollow ground. And that's uh, what uh, swamp cedar is. But it's kind of a sad story in swamp cedar to where my people were massacred. Oh, everybody, old men, old women, children. And uh, I think about, and I pray with them. It's, it's a kind of, uh, makes me feel good when I go down there and go visit them. And uh, there was a couple of Shoshone ladies that managed to escape. So uh, I always think about them too, the relatives. Thankful for them, even up their blood for me to be here today and talk with you people. And uh, so uh, we consider Trump Cedars Normally, Rocky Mountain juniper do not grow in moist uh, soil, but there it does. And our belief is that those uh, juniper trees are tall and they are being fertilized by the remains of our people 
that were massacred and are still today making that swamp theaters what it is today. And we fought that, keep that in place as an educational tool for our young people who are yet coming to tell them what had happened. I know a lot of people don't like to uh, do uh, tell um, the people about what the federal government did to the American Indians. You know, we've gone through genocide. You know, they try to get rid of us. Subjugation, assimilation, and now reservations. So uh, I'm proud to say that we are an example of resilient people. And I want to preserve Trump theaters as much as I can to uh, keep the legacy of that place and uh, to keep it as a reminder, as an honorary for my young people that are still coming, coming, uh, coming our way. So uh, I will devoted all my time and energy in protecting that place. And uh, like I said earlier, it's, it's taken a long time, but I feel it's worth it. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Chairman Steele. And, you know, I, uh, I'm always, when we speak about this, I'm always so impressed, touched and impressed by how a st relatively small group of people, yourself and Delane and others, um, have made really a huge impact in this um, story. It's really a, like a, a David and Goliath type story of the Southern Nevada Water Authority, this um, enormous uh, public utility uh, that has hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, Nevada land, water rights, and billions of dollars to force this kind of project through. And um, you mentioned your father, you've been working on this project for many years. Um, and there, like I said, there's a, a broad coalition of people who stand with you, including the ranchers and the LDS church. Um, but it's still a, a real imbalance of um, power. And I'm always impressed by uh, how successful you've been um, in preventing this project from happening. Um, Kyle, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the um, the scope of this project um, and the current efforts to um, make sure that groundwater mining doesn't happen. And um, you could just give a little more um, background on uh, that fight and where it is now and, and how those of us who are just coming to it could um, contribute. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Chairman Steele. And, and thank you, uh, Delane. And uh, before I, I talk a little bit about the project, I just want to recognize how much those two have have sacrificed over the years, whether it's, you know, their time and, and their energy and, and their resources. Um, it uh, it's it's just uh, so emblematic of, of selflessness. And um, and I also, you know, just just want to recognize that, you know, there those those lands that are now home to 
farms and ranches and national parks and, and federal lands. They they are uh, they're stolen lands. And, um, you know, when I'm when I'm out that way, I, I do view it as a as a you know great, great privilege uh, to be out there. And I've been you know lucky to have learned about, you know, the true histories from folks like Delane and, and Rupert. And so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and recognize that. Um, and I think, you know, let's let's take a, a step back and look at the Las Vegas pipeline fight that started in 1989. Southern Nevada Water Authority, uh, or SUNWA as we call them, you know, what that really means is they're the people who provide water to Las Vegas, to the big casinos, to the golf courses and to all the homes and residential uh, development out there. And in, in 1989, uh, a couple of officials, you know, in conjunction with big banks and home developers and politicians realized that the Colorado River um, isn't what it was um, projected to be via uh, the 1922 Colorado River Compact, which, as we know now, is a deeply flawed compact. Um, but, you know, they uh, they realized that they needed more water. And so they looked uh, northward to uh, to these valleys uh, right along the Nevada, Utah border. And. Uh, as as was mentioned earlier, these these valleys are on top of you know what we call the the carbonate aquifer, and these are ice age era uh, water supplies that um, that have remained since um, you know Lake Bonneville essentially um, subsided, and what we know of Lake Bonneville today is is the Great Salt Lake and. A lot of the water in the area that we're talking about still flows underground to um, to the Great Salt Lake, and um, you know, I can talk about that later. But anyways, so they started going out there, and they were filing filing for groundwater. Uh, that's mostly what we're talking about here. They were buying up uh, ranches, spending tens of millions of dollars buying up ranches, trying to kick out ranchers uh, and farmers. And um, and so then it, it just, you know, that ultimately led to a um, a process where, you know, they needed Congress to get things done. They needed uh, state lawmakers to get things done. They needed regulators to get it done. And you know, what ultimately happened was uh, a coalition of, of folks saw what was happening they knew it was going to be a giant water grab and they banded together uh to fight this thing and for a little uh more history prior to the snwa's water grab there was this big proposal for a whole underground network uh missile transportation system called the mx missile project and so a lot of these interests um, in eastern Nevada and western Utah had kind of banded together uh, to stop that. And, and, and they ultimately did. And through that process, you know, the military had dug all these uh, well sites. And so they realized how much water was there and that kind of became public. So that that's a there's multiple nexuses between the MX project and, and the Vegas pipeline fight. But not only was it like that's how kind of the public at large learned about all the water, but it also built the foundation upon which uh, many of the relationships that were used to thwart the, the Vegas pipeline fight were born. And so, um, you know, and I guess to kind of uh, put things into perspective, to get to where we are today has taken seven legal battles in um in federal and state court and uh my organization water network of which delane is a board member and um and rupert who's who's been a long time ally and and his tribe and delane's tribe and the duck water shoshone folks have have all been uh fighting in various capacities all along but in um this spring we had a major uh, victory in a, in a district court uh, in the state of Nevada, 
And um, after that, you know, it was a very damning victory for them. The judge, the judge understood what was going on. The judge understood that the project was going to um, suck the, the aquifers dry. And therefore, if you suck those aquifers dry, you kill the swamp cedars. And, uh, and, and, and that, um, you know, that was something that, thanks to Rupert and Delane over the years, came, came to light. And, um, and, and really, you know, we can't be shy about saying it. If you kill the swamp cedars, you're, you're, you're essentially committing cultural genocide. Um, and that, uh, that, I think it was an important part of, of why we won. So we had, we had this, this major court victory and our opponents at the state level, the state of Nevada was also a, an opponent of ours as well as the, the SNWA decided not to appeal this district court decision to the, uh, to the state, uh, Supreme court. And so, and then what ultimately happened was the SNWA said, well, we're going to defer this project for the next 30 years and we're going to focus more on, I mean, they, they didn't say 30 years exactly. They said indefinitely defer. And, and they said, we're going to do more conservation. We're going to focus on the Colorado River. Um, but you know, none of us are naive enough to think that they're going to go away because they still, they're major uh, private landholders. They have uh, almost a million acres of uh, grazing allotments with, uh, with the federal government. They have tens of thousands of acres of water rights, and they have applications for tens of thousands of acres of even more water rights. Um, and, and so, you know, they're not, they're not going away uh, anytime soon. And, you know, we always compare this to the Owens Valley case. And, you know, we, um, we, we all had a big talk with folks in Owens Valley years ago. And I think one thing for me coming out of that is that once a major utility gets a foothold in a place, they, they don't want to leave. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we're at this unique juncture where I think our, our opponents in this just want to, they hope that, you know, people die and people forget and, you know, society will move along. And then whenever the, whenever the Colorado River is running at a trickle, um, you know, they'll be able to, you know, do things like change the laws that help provide us with a victory and then go in, grab the water, um, all, all things, you know, uh, detrimental to us, you know, be damned because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the same big banks, the same big real estate developers and the same types of politicians will likely still exist in, in Las Vegas. And so, um, you know, now we're at this unique juncture where we're working with Chairman Steele and Delane and the other tribes on trying to provide long-term protections so that no matter what, um, Basawabi uh, remains. And you know, that's, that's kind of my brief overview. And thank you for providing me with the opportunity to share, Oscar. Thank you, Kyle. That was really informative. Um, and you, touch on Basawabi uh, as, as Chairman Steele did as well. And um, uh, as I mentioned, it's really a place, I think for all of us who've been there that has um, uh, an incredible um, spiritual significance that you can feel when you're there. It's really, um, uh, I, I, unique landscape it's a culturally unique landscape that we'll talk about a little bit more but it's it's really a place um unlike any other place i've been and um uh i've been really affected by the the stories of that place and i wonder um delane um if you could speak a little bit about um what that means to you I, you know to me the 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 history uh of this place is embodied by the trees themselves they're 
you know, the, the trees uh, have a relationship to the ancestors. Um, and some of those trees, I guess, um, are quite old. And um, so they have a real um, connection to uh, the, the stories that have happened at that place. And, um, and I'd like to just hear uh, from you what that place means and, and why it's so crucial to protect that uh, one of a kind um, uh, ecosystem there. Well, uh, yes, I'm here to tell you the same thing I told the state legislature the other day, so I'll be reading this. I'm here to tell my family's story and express to you all why we must protect sacred tribal resources within Spring Valley, which is in White Pine County and nestled between the Snake Range and the Shell Creek Range. My mother was born on land that is now within the borders of the Great Basin National Park. My dad was dad my dad was born just west of Spring Valley in White River Valley. My family has been in this part of the Great Basin since time immemorial. I'm here today to encourage you all to protect what's sacred to my family and my tribe. The Spring Valley stands of Rocky Mountain juniper trees, known locally as the swamp cedars. Spiritually and culturally, the swamp cedars go with an area referred to by my people as Basawabi, which means a sacred water valley in the Nua language. Basawabi was an important meeting place for the Nua and still is today. Indigenous from around the Great Basin travel far and wide to congregate in, on these sacred lands. Before colonization, indigenous people from across the Great Basin, uh oh, Okay, I'm gonna repeat that again. Before colonization, indigenous people from across the Great Basin traveled far and wide to congregate. It was a place for prayer, celebration, medicine and rejuvenation. And that remains so today. The spiritual and cultural past of the swamp cedars represent what it means to be native and what it means to be Nua. However, the swamp cedars also tell a damning story about the history of Nevada and the colonization of my people. Spring Valley was home to at least three massacres of native people between 1850 and 1900. Two were military-led engagements. The third was conducted by a band of vigilantes, and that's the one that Rupert was referring to. My grandmother was one of the two women, two, the two girls who survived last massacre. As she hid in the ditch, she witnessed bloodthirsty thugs kill off her relatives and friends and desecrate the place of worship. Her place is closed. For the remaining Nua people, it is our first belief that the Swamp Cedars and Spring Valley embody the spirits of the lives lost during three massacres. That's why they're so strong. The significance, significance of Basawabi to my people is hard to describe. One comparison would be to places like Mecca or Vatican City. However, another comparison would be to a massacre site like Wounded Knee and countless other sites where native unjustly attacked. These facts are well established. That is why Basawabi is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as a traditional cultural property. Unfortunately, that status does not ensure that the swamp cedars will continue to thrive there. Climate change, drought, overpumping of the water table, and human activity are real threats to the long-term survival of the swamp cedars. Now that you know a little bit about the history of Spring Valley and Basawabi, it is important to understand the fragile place the swamp cedars have in the ecosystem there. The Rocky Mountain junipers in Spring Valley are unlike any other stand of species in the American West, as you mentioned. The Spring Valley swamp cedars grow elevations below 6,000 feet. In most area, the location of the mountain west, they grow about above 8,000. 
The high water table in Spring Valley allows the shallow rooted swamp cedars to exist. And then that water table goes down, it's the end. They are sandwiched on BLM lands alongside agricultural operations. When you walk through our sacred side, it's not uncommon to see livestock feces. Then I want, went on to re request some legislation to cover that. And uh, it's uh, it's just been a sacred place for generations of my people, and it still is. And as Rupert mentioned, it's just a, well, there, there's evidence that they've been there for hundreds of thousands of years. And thousands, <laughs> that, was, that was a little over, a little overkill on that one. <laughs> Okay. Okay. We. I think I'll finish up what I was what I was going. This. Uh, we are not asking to kick out the cattle and sheep that graze alongside our ancestors. We are not asking to seal the borders. We are just asking for our religious and cultural beliefs to be respected and understood. Our identity as Native peoples is inextricably tied to Balsababi and the swamp cedars. Losing the cedars means losing us, and we don't want to go. Don't have much else. Thank you, Lion. Thank you. That's really such a powerful uh, portrait of what that place means. And um, I, you know, there, the, I, I'm, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm I, listening to you. It, it, it always, um, the story really affects me and, um, and I, I, it's strange because I understand that, that this isn't a story that a lot of people know. It's a story that, um, that unfortunately hasn't been um, taught well enough in, in our education. Um, and it's a story that hasn't been recognized. It isn't recognized by um, the current, um, government entities that uh, deal with this landscape. Um, but it's also something that isn't recognized, um, that, that we have a hard time recognizing these trees and this place as really um, a monument, right? Like you were speaking about the Vatican and um, Arlington National Cemetery, and um, there's no marker there at Basawabi, as far as I know, that that um, explains the significance. Or there's no statue, and there's no there's no memorial there on the site. But what's there is the trees themselves, and the trees themselves have this um, real power uh in them and and i i don't know if there's a real clear answer to this but i wonder if, you know um for you uh as an artist um what does it mean to look at that tree or to be with those trees and and how can we um appreciate those trees as as the monuments um that that they are i don't know if that makes sense but well let me just back up a little bit my mother and my dad were both orphans and uh they were picked up and sent off to the uh, Indian school at uh, Nevada when they were little kids, and uh, so and and they they were trying to take the Indian out of the Indian kids, 
And so when I was growing up, they spoke very little about about, 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 about Basawabi. And it took a long time for me to be able to get their get the story from them and, and my other relatives. So that's why it hasn't isn't known to the general public. But we are working on there's a group of us, including five agencies, who are working on putting up a kiosk uh, in Spring Valley, uh, just south of Osawa, pull their vehicles in there. And, and uh, it, we, I don't expect we'll have that until next summer, there, but there's a quite the Great Basin National Heritage Area and uh, represented in the uh, wind farm is helping us and that sort of thing. So I think once we get that up, it will at least begin to teach the, the, the general public what's happening. And I think that's all I have to say about that. Oscar, this is Rupert. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rupert. Um, those trees, they're just like um, all of us. The water there um, is being refreshed through the veins of those trees that are that are growing there. So if they eat over that water, it's gonna stop that water from feeding the veins of those trees, just like the blood in our bodies. It's the same thing that, uh, spiritual away, it affects us. So when I go down there and talk with them, I'm talking to my relatives in a way that, uh, you know, I go there in a good way. I'm not there to uh, raise heck with them or offend them. And uh, I ask them to watch over me, you know, wherever I go. So spiritually, I ask them for that help because they gave their life and blood for us to be here. So uh, that's how important those trees are to, to us. Thank you. Um, I, When I hear you speak about the Basawabi, I, I also wonder, um, knowing that it's a very unique place that, that, like we said, these trees really don't grow anywhere else in the world. They grow higher in the, in the mountains, um, actually in locations all over the world, but they don't grow in these valleys. And here in Spring Valley, you have this one small uh, group of trees um, that grows in this one place. And, and I can't help but wonder, is this, was this population there and cared for by the Newe people? Um, intentionally, was that place created by ancestors of Goshut and Shoshone people and cared for and, and cultivated um, like a, a garden? I mean, was it created for that reason? But the, um, we don't know. Well, we, we don't have, <laughs> go ahead, Rupert. Yeah, we don't know uh, if that whole valley was uh, covered with uh, uh, juniper trees at one time. It may have been, but uh, you know, climate change has uh, taken uh, a toll on some of those trees and um, left only the uh, strongest ones there. But we don't know that. But uh, you know, when our people got massacred in those trees, why? Uh, our belief is that uh, they're there, uh, being fertilized 
by the remains of our people. And that's why they're still there growing in the water. And you know what? We like to see them there for a long time. Go ahead, Delaine. Well, I was just going to point out that there was no written history, but we had that we it's the it's a record uh, that we've been around here for close to 10,000 years. So much, much could happen in that time. Oscar, if uh, I, I may jump in and just add w one little thing and, and expound on what uh, Delane and Rupert have have said. When when you're in in Spring Valley, uh, you can you can understand why it it was a, a a place where people from all over that region would go because you know especially before colonization there was there was water uh, uh, available and there were. Uh, grasses available and and other flora available. I you, you go in there with uh, with Delane and she'll tell you about the wild asparagus that uh, that once grew in there and and other plant life um, that 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 provided nourishment. And I think uh, it's it's important to to mention that just because it's it's so easy to understand why native people would have been targeted there uh, ultimately because it it just makes so much sense to me that that it it would be a place of of celebration of healing of of prayer um because of of its uh abundance of of resources prior to uh prior to colonization Great. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, um, uh, I think it's, uh, the juniper tree also is something, it's a food source and, and the, um, pinion pine that grows there also is, uh, a food. And so, um, we start to see really, um, this the unique dimensions of this place and this ecology that make it um so significant um and uh so i guess um um one thing that i'd like to to ask of all of you um, is um, at, as as we um, work to protect this place and to um, to um, communicate all of that's um, special about uh, Spring Valley particularly. Um, you know, my hope is is that the water school in whatever form when I am able to, to build something there um, is really a, a place that will bring uh, people there in a respectful way um, to learn about the place, um, but that also um, really should contribute to the ongoing efforts to protect um, and learn about uh, Basawabi. So uh, maybe it's a question for each of you. Um, what would, a, what could water school, what could a, a water school be there in Spring Valley uh, at Cedar Spring and, and what um, role could it play? Uh, in this question, kind of an open-ended question, but um, curious to hear from each of you. Elders first. 
Go ahead, yeah. Kyle, sorry. Yeah, oh, I was going to yeah, yeah, go ahead, Delaine or Rupert. Please. Uh, now, I, now I got all screwed up. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going away. Hello, this is Rick. I'm here. I'm an Indian too. <laughs> There's my mom. She's an Indian. <laughs> I, I think what, uh, what, what we can, uh, what's, what's really important out here is to remind people that this is a desert and that there just isn't that much water and that if you do take water on the ground you kill what's on the surface almost immediately within you know maybe a decade or two um, so even though there is a claim that there's a lot of water under this ground there's also the usgs has, has said that there are tens of thousands of acre feet that flow underneath into other valleys so my guess is there is probably not nearly as much water as some people might think. And that's not really surprising because this is a desert. And uh, I think what's really important is to point out that this place is very fragile. And if you try to turn it into something else or take away the what, what what little water it has taking water from the desert is going to basically kill everything thank you yeah uh, but this is rupert uh picture a uh, circle of life in the circle of life there's uh there's us there's uh the rabbits there's the trees, there's the soil, all the um, the uh, plant and animal life around the circle of life. And water's in there. And if ever any one of those circle of life components is removed, for example, you take water out, the rest of it will follow. There's no water cannot survive, including the human life. And uh, the water has to be uh, has to be there in Spring Valley for it to survive. You know, all the waterfall, uh, the animals, the trees, anything that's there will die off. If you remove water from the circle of life, and uh, water here in uh, the Great Basin Desert is very important, and it must remain there. And to uh, uh, pump it away would be desecrating life. If, if I were to add to what um, Rick and, and Chairman Steele said, you know, I often think about um, giving and taking. And, um, you know, I, I look at it as, you know, Rupert, Delane and, and Rick, they've, they, they've given they've given me so much. And that implies that, you know, I'm I'm taking from them. And, and, and it's more in, in this case, you know, something. Um, cognitive and you know th thought provoking you know what I'm taking but then you know what do what do I give back and so you know for example if I'm at the cedars with them I'm I'm giving water uh, to to the cedars and you know I'm I'm um, you know offering thanks for for what I'm taking in there as 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 just a non-native man who who does find a great significance there but and then you know I imply that give and take kind of thought process at, at another level um, when I think about things like sprawl development and in metropolitan areas or areas that want to become a metropolitan area 
you know, we're, we're currently fighting, um, and, you know, the Great Basin Water Network, that's Delane and, and Rick and Chairman Steele on behalf of uh, the Go Shoot people. We're fighting another pipeline right on the other side of Great Basin National Park. So, you know, on on the uh, on the west side, we have Spring Valley. But now on, on, on the east side, we got a pipeline that would go from Cedar City to some valleys real close to, to the park. And they want to take that water to grow, un, you know, unfettered for green lawns in the deserts and the high deserts of Cedar City. And so it's all these people who just want to take, 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 and they don't want to give anything back. And I think what water school could do is is help people understand what, you know, the real benefits that we will get for generations to come when we think more about giving rather than rather than taking. Now, convincing real estate developers and water officials and other hucksters and um and in, in a region that only cares about economic growth uh, is a difficult thing to do. But I think there there's hope for for humanity um, in the long run. And I think that give and take is important. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, I think um, you're absolutely right. Um, that it's time for us to think about giving back and also thinking about, <clears throat> you know, I think um, that unfortunately in, in the past, we've often fallen into the trap of thinking that there's some, that there, there are resources that can be expendable, that, um, that this land in the desert isn't really useful for anyone and we can um, just take what we need from it uh, to build a city and um, what I have learned in my time going there to Spring Valley is really that it's the center of the world it's it's the center of that that world there uh, is the water and it's just as vital uh, there uh, as as anywhere else, certainly as um, the other uses that are proposed for it. Um, and um, I think there's, uh, for, for all of us, just a lot to be learned about the significance of these places. And um, uh, oh, I can put it. I could put it short. No place should be a wasteland so that people could waste. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Um well um I uh Thought maybe it's a good moment to to see if there are any questions. Um, uh, we've been going on for a little while. I, I think we're a small group, um, but if there are any questions, please um, feel welcome to to type something in the chat box there. Um, and of course, there's much more information about all of this on the website of the Great Basin Water Network. Um, and uh, there's just a wealth of great information out there. Um, as Kyle um, referred to, you know, the, the, the struggle against this process is ongoing and there's, there's constantly um, news in this uh in this fight so um i encourage anyone to educate themselves that way um and um and yeah the, you know on a personal level i, I just want to say um that i had hoped that this would be a, an in-person gathering um you know we started planning this meeting uh back, it must have been in February or March before all of this happened. Um, 
I've been hoping to bring all of us together out there at Cedar Spring in April for a, an in-person meeting um, to talk about these ideas uh, in person and, and bring together a small group. Um, and of course, uh, the pandemic and <laughs> everything else had other plans. Um, but uh, I still hope that um, at some point we'll, we'll be able to uh, have a in-person version of this meeting um, and uh, in any case, just really glad that um, we have managed to connect in this way and um, uh, certainly won't be the end of this for me. It's still um, really uh, at the beginning of, of thinking about how we can um, give back to the water of, of Spring Valley that's given us all so much. So um, thank you. Thank you, Rick and Elaine. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you, Chairman Steele, for being here today. Um, really meaningful. And thank you, Oscar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thanks, thanks to Land and to Laura for hosting us. And um, we'll be putting this up uh, on a web, the website of Water School that's uh, just about to launch. Uh, we'll have this inter this conversation, um, another recent conversation that we did about the water around uh, Los Angeles and Owens Valley, and we'll be following up with further uh, events and conversations on that website soon. So stay tuned. Um, Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Laura, for setting everything up. Of course. Thank you guys for being here. Have a great day. Thank you.